everyone. I'm so happy to be here today for our official relaunch. I've been here for almost three years and I've enjoyed meeting many of our partners and supporters that I see here today. One of these supporters is Tableau Foundation, who's been a wonderful ally in our work. Our mission and vision, along with Tableau's commitment to racial justice, has materialized to this wonderful moment. I'm so proud of what we have achieved and what we are going to achieve. A few quick reminders for today's meeting is, it will last about one hour. You'll hear from civic influencers leadership, followed by a wonderful panel of investors and stakeholders and a dedicated Q&A. As Elise stated, we will be answering questions during and after the panel. Please place your questions in the Q&A and remember to tweet or use social media during our conversation. We will put various hashtags in the chat room. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful board chair, Liz Ricci. Everyone here, and thank you for joining us. In particular, I wanna welcome and thank our partners at Tableau, Neil and Channing, for joining with us to meet the moment. I'm Liz Ritchie, the current board chair, and I couldn't be more excited about the future of our organization. I'm proud of the work that's been done so far by the project that Paul started so many years ago, and we are all grateful for the tremendous impact that Campus Election Engagement Project has had on students across the country but I couldn't be more excited than by our relaunch as civic influencers under the leadership of our new CEO, Maxim Thorne. It is Maxim's vision and leadership that we have been waiting for, for this is a time of urgency and a deep seriousness of purpose. For our democracy to survive, we must empower young people with the tools they need to learn about and to advocate for their right to vote. This is especially true for our youth of color. We are committed to a data and results driven approach to power these young voices and votes. And now I am privileged to introduce our new leader, Maxim Thorne. Thank you, Liz. I am thrilled to be here and to thank all of you for all of the incredible work and investment in our democracy and making sure that young people can play a part in democracy since our founding. Thanks to Paul Loeb for the vision of creating this amazing organization in 2008. We have a lot to do. And in the last four months, we have been prepping and planning for how we will relaunch and seize this moment. As, as our board chair Liz said, it is an urgent moment. Our democracy is in crisis. I certainly, did not and cannot do this alone. We have an incredible team, and I'd like to introduce you to our chiefs leadership team. First, there is Patrick Coakley, our chief of, of organizing, advocacy, and learning. Patrick has a deep background in disability advocacy and policy. Next is Ian Richard, who is our chief of media, marketing, and communications. She has grown multiple communication departments, and most recently in the health space. Next, and similarly coming from the health industry, is Kyle Idahosa, who is our data scientist. Uh, Kyle is an epidemiologist and has been doing a lot of work, including with data visualization that tracks and tries to help young people, particularly young people of color, who have been affected by various kinds of epidemics. You've just met Nasheen Ansari, our Chief of Stakeholder Engagement, who has been so long with uh, this organization and came with me back from, a, from another one. And I cannot tell you how invaluable she has been to me and to our entire organization. Rachel Gambino is our Chief of Staff, uh, who is, for those of you who are Trekkies, we call her Deanna Troy. And keeping us sane, paying us, Dealing with all the operations, because she has been here from almost the start, is our operations manager, Brenna Limbrick. There you have the leadership team who supports even greater numbers of staff and civic influencers around the country. I've been asked, I'm sure this may be a question on lots of your minds. How did we come up with civic influencers? Well, 
we have been taking a very data-driven approach to figuring out how do we actually move young people, like Gen Z, the most diverse uh, population in American history. How do we actually use words that would motivate them, connect with them, which may be different than what connects with a different generation. And what we know, if, and if you've been dealing with young people, you will know this, they all want to be influencers. This may be, this may be, this may be because of the fascination with someone like Kim Kardashian or Lil Nas X or Katy Perry, but, or a young activist like all of those young people from the Margaret Stone Douglas High School. And so the understanding for lots of young people, and this is across all socioeconomic and racial diversity of young people. They all want to be, they want to, all want to be influencers, which is a word for power. Can they help shape and influence their peers and organize them, whether it's to in, in the marketplace for merchandise or in other uh, ways in which you think. What we did is seize that word and marry it to something that we all care about, civics. And that's how we came up with civic influencer, which has been embraced and understood by lots and lots of our constituencies. And it played well, it's been researched, and that's where we are. We're really thrilled with, with the movement that we're investing in. We have interrogated with data, where are their power outages for youth civic power? Let me explain how we came up with that similar to an electric power grid. Now I live in Patterson, New Jersey, which Alexander Hamilton founded. It became America's first industrial city. It has the largest waterfall in, in North America outside of Niagara. People don't remember that. And the electric power grid expanded from Patterson and connected lots of other communities and spread over, over decades and centuries to encompass just about all of America. Very recently, we, knew our, we know our electric power grid was hacked. We had cas cascaded by Russians, cascading blackouts and power outages. And climate change has affected our electric power grid. When that happens, we all know what happens when we have a power outage. The food in our refrigerator could spoil, have more serious effects. You can't get into the ER. You can't have dialysis. You could die and people have died. That's the analogy we're making with civic power. We have a civic power grid that started at the birth of our country. It was limited and only connected men, property owners, white Protestants. Over the centuries, it's included more. A hundred years ago with the 19th Amendment, it, it grew to include women. With the civil rights movement, the power grid expanded and, start, and started to include more directly people of color and African-Americans and Latinx communities and tribal folks. 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, when the voting rights age was lowered, to 18 by the 26th amendment, it, it grew and included more young people. However, what we've seen is significant power outages. From 2013 with the Shelby case, we have seen cascading blackouts, deliberate attempts to shut off people of color and particularly young people and young people of color from our civic power grid. Our mission is to reconnect young people to the civic power grid, expand that civic power grid to be more inclusive and all of us to work uh, to increasing youth voter turnout and their opportunity to live in the democracy that we promised them, that our democracy will last and be sustainable. And the baton of this generation will pass to the next and onward because America's democracy means so much to everyone else. But that is not what's happening. We are actually seeing direct action targeting young people and young people of color. And with me today, I could not tell you how thrilled I am to introduce one of our civic influencers in Eastern Michigan, Ariana Khan. Hi, my name is Ariana Khan. Most people just call me Ari though. I go by she, they pronouns and I'm a senior at Eastern Michigan University pursuing a degree in public administration and statistics and mathematics. Um, I started with Campus Elect in January of 2020, so pre-pandemic, and I really only started because I really wanted to be involved with community. Um, I've always been a very community oriented person. I thought that this would be a really cool way to just like hit the streets and speak to people and really bring them out to the polls. Um, but when the pandemic hit 
And as I got deeper into this work at the same time, I noticed a lot of systemic failures. And it became really clear that this idea that youth civic engagement wasn't happening because of apathy, because it wasn't cool enough for young people was a complete bold faced lie. Young people care and they care a lot and they know a lot more than we give them credit for. But there are so many structural problems that keep them from voting. Like if your school doesn't give you election day as a holiday, that's not really incentive for you to go skip class and vote. Or if you do get the day off, but you have an exam the next day, that's also not really incentive. If you don't know if you have the correct voter ID or if you know that your voter ID that you have doesn't properly reflect you, um, if you lack transportation or if you're dealing with housing insecurity, all of these are issues that young people come up with, but specifically queer young people more than other marginalized populations. Um, that's especially why I'm really proud of my work with the Queer the Vote Project um, in the fall 2020 election. Um, because of the conditions of the pandemic, it basically culminated in about 200 um, Zoom meetings that were either like two-on-ones or one-on-ones. Um, and that was where I found community. I really connected with people and I heard like, why it matters to them to go vote, like why they're still prioritizing civic engagement despite all of these barriers. Um, and it was really inspirational, but it also was a little heartbreaking because it shouldn't have had to be such a process. It should have been so much easier than it was. Um, I think through this all, I really just decided that I wanted to do work that centered on sustainable access. So not just quick fixes for the moment, but something that would last a really long time. And I wanted accessibility to be built around convenience because honestly, things need to be simple for them to be possible. If voting isn't as simple as tying your shoe, so you know where, when, and how it's happening, you know that once you've tied it, it's set and good to go, that knot's not budging, then people aren't going to be motivated to do it. and we can no longer afford to live in this era where we blame everyone for their lack of access. It's time to step up and start being the solution. Thank you, Ariana. Ariana is, is making the great point of that we have these power outages, which she calls systemic failures in our system. What we're trying to do is have over 600 of Ariana's, all those exceptional young people who care about our democracy, and care about empowering their peers. And that's what we're doing. We're helping train them. Here's what we learned in 2020. Young people actually do vote and they make a difference. Young people showed up in the 2020 presidential elections. All the myths about them not caring were proven false, particularly the Georgia runoffs. All the myths about young black people not voting and not voting in runoffs or people of color not voting on runoffs were disproved in the Georgia runoffs of 2021 in January. And we know that they matter because they are deliberate efforts to shut them out of the political process and prevent them from voting. What we also know is that we have this rapidly changing landscape in America and in our voting rights system. We've had to figure out in terms of our data, where do we actually need to be? Where are the power outages happening? And they're happening particularly in communities of color. We are seeing gerrymandered campuses, particularly HBCU, historically black college, colleges and university campuses being gerrymandered. And we also have seen uh, a proof that we can share with young people that their votes matter. So for example, if the voting uh, margin in Arizona was 10,000 votes, which is which what it was, or Georgia, it's like 11,000 votes, or Wisconsin, like 20, 22,000 votes. That's not even one campus. That may not even be a dorm. When you're thinking about colleges like Miami Dade College, which is the largest college in America, normally it has about 125,000 students in uh, Florida District 27, but we've also seen a sharp decline in enrollment. Across the country, the decline in enrollment is about 20% of community colleges. I just told you Miami-Dade College would normally have about 125,000. My understanding is that that's almost half of what it was today in 2021. In Georgia, the decline is like 50,000, 50% of community college enrollment. When you actually think then 
about the margins. If most of the organizing is done on college campuses and there's a 20% decline overall nationwide and places are having 50% decline in, in college enrollment, then if we did everything the way we used to do, all the areas where young people's votes mattered would be different, would be totally different. The numbers, the math to success for young people prevailing on the issues they care about would work against them. So we are now organizing both on campus and off campus to make sure that we are equipping young people with the knowledge and we're interrogating what it is that actually helps. We're looking at things like do polling sites on college campus help? But we're also ranking them. Or is it again, making sure that they have voter IDs that are compliant, that their students' IDs that are compliant with voter IDs? Or is it important for the president or chancellor to give them time off from classes? What about voter registration drives? Dorm storming if they're back on campus or in some sort of hybrid mode? Or is there a campus voter portal on the uh, website of the campus? And figure out what combination, what cocktail will actually drive young people to the polls and make them overcome and fight uh, to overcome these barriers. And so where we are today is that we have measured a lot of these things and begin to give them weighted averages. And we're gonna share with you what's so exciting um, about what we think is going to impact and be revolutionary for the entire voting ecosystem, but particularly for young people's voting, where they can understand in their own words, with their own data and their own analysis, what's happening to them in terms of voting. I'm pleased to introduce you to one of our Blue Ribbon uh, committee members, Chantilly Jagannath, uh, who also works with um, Tableau. They call her a Zen master. Uh, so here's what we've done. We have created a youth democracy index, which is what we're calling what I just called, these scorecards. And this is fueling a heat map of America. Uh, so here is the heat map. And what you are seeing here is those large lightning bolts, like the electric power grid that has lightning bolts, those large uh, lightning bolts depict Senate races where young people are in a significant majority of the, of, of the population that they can affect those big lightning bolts. What you see in the small black lightning bolts are district races in 2022, where young people, again, are a significant part of the population and properly organized and, and taught and, 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 and mobilized and, and advocating, uh, they can also affect and they can build their civic power, reconnect to the civic power grid and vote. So Chantilly, uh, why don't you uh, share with, with everyone who's here how this works, how this uh, heat map works by going say first to Virginia. Absolutely. So we'll start by selecting Virginia. There you have it. So Virginia uh, has a gubernatorial election in 2020, in 2021, this year. Now, what, now what, what we've seen is that um, this is an entire state that has a significant young people's population, but, and also young people um, on college campuses. With our analysis of what triggers young people to vote or not vote, we are scoring in a particularly interesting way, similar to your cell phone power, uh, how these campuses are enabling and empowering young people to vote. So let's go to the campuses in Virginia. So here, right? So we're looking at a, a significant house race in Virginia, which is Virginia number seven. In district seven, you see those universities that are there. So think about when your uh, cell phone is powered fully, you have that green. When it's actually like losing a lot of power, you're in the bright red. So you're like you have the green alerts and the amber alerts. And so we are actually alerting uh, campuses and young people to their, their situation of having analyzed those things I told you. You'll see it on, on, on the pop-up screen, whether they, are, uh, um, whether they have polling sites on campus, uh, whether there's a holiday given by, by the president or chancellor of the university, whether polling sites are in walking distance, and any other number of factors that we have tested and we know work in various ways, especially in combination that helps. 
And so, as I said earlier, you, I'm so pleased to see that bright green is Virginia Commonwealth University, where one of our board members, Nanad Bailey, uh, comes from. Uh, and I think we can see the best practices that they do and share that across the entire ecosystem of campuses and also activists and allies uh, to the cause of democracy. But let me show you a different state, Florida. So Florida, uh, and now we're gonna go to District 27, is an interesting state that also debunks stereotypes, right? So Florida has Miami-Dade College, which as I mentioned, is the largest college in the United States, normally with 125,000 students. 95% of those students are students of color. Here's what's interesting. In 2014, it had a Republican uh, as its congressperson. In uh, 2016, it had a Republican as its congressperson. In 2018, it had a Democrat as its co congressperson. That was Donna Shalala, who some of you might remember, was the uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration and became the president of the University of Miami. And in 2020, she lost uh, to Congresswoman Salazar, who is a Republican. It is a very, very minority uh, 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 district. And, it's, and the young people there on the largest college in America are 95% students of color. So if you look at the margin of victory in the last congressional race in, in Florida 27, it was 9,383, when that campus population is nearing 100 or over 100,000. And you'll see each of you see each of those as the Shandy, uh, how much how many young people and what the population of students of color are on those particular things. And this is and you'll see like Miami did Kendall campus is also bright green. Uh, and I think Josh, uh, who we work with, uh, we're so proud of at uh, that campus is also in the audience today. Um, now let's go to Michigan. So here is Michigan. And, and, and what we're showing you is young people, by the way, are fueling, are funneling data and analyzing the data based on their experience. So we're creating this novel data set that is actually powering the Youth Democracy Index that comes up with the scores, these uh, cell phone-like colors, but also uh, coming up with how they rank what is inhibiting their, their ability to vote or to register to vote, or what's actually aiding their ability to vote, et cetera. And here's an example. What else do you do? We can actually, we have our civic influencers on video. You click on it, and there she is. My name is Ariana Khan. Most Ariana again. And so around the country, um, we are able uh, to have young people engaged in gathering data, uh, in real time sharing that data, having their stories be data driven, and having their stories and being a witness being a witness uh, to what's happening to them and the efforts to deliberately shut off them from our, from our civic power grid and all that we can do and bring allies uh, to this fight. And I cannot thank you enough, Tableau Foundation, for investing in this approach. This approach is so necessary if we're gonna save our democracy. It enhances uh, our, our ability to know what tactics work with young people. And it allows us in a very, uh, easy way to explain to young people and everyone else, media, what's happening on a campus and in a community and around the country. So I am uh, so happy now to introduce another member of Blue Ribbon uh, Committee, Professor Sharon Bloyd Peshkin. Uh, Sharon uh, has been a mentor to me. Uh, she, she has chatted with me about uh, the fact that we are dealing with solutions to some of the most grave problems in our democracy. And I hadn't heard of the term solutions journalism until I met Sharon. Um, she has uh, shared with me the importance of stories, going beyond the data, but marrying data with human stories, like you just saw us do with Ariana. Sharon is a professor of journalism in the communications department at Columbia College in Chicago, and is the creator of Columbia Votes. One of Sharon's specialties is teaching solutions journalism, which, which is about stories, about responses to problems and what insights can be learned from them. We've invited her to help draw out the story about the exciting and replicable response we've embarked upon to the problem of engaging youth and particularly marginalized youth, black, 
Latino and indigenous First Nations youth in voting. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Maxim. It is such a pleasure to work with you, to work with the whole group of civic influencers. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, Neil Myrick, Channing Nesbitt, Chantilly Jagernath, Michael Smith, and again, Ari Khan, whom I'll introduce one at a time. So Neil Myrick is global head of the Tableau Foundation, which was established in 2014 to accelerate the use of data in solving the world's biggest problems. The foundation partners with numerous organizations working to accelerate social change, from using data to track and combat infectious disease, to visualizing the impact of climate change on communities. And now with civic influencers to engage more marginalized youth in the voting process. And Tableau is a Salesforce company. And then Channing Nesbitt, who is the social impact program manager and senior administrator at Tableau Software and co-leader of the Racial Justice Data Initiative, where he helps to build partnerships with businesses and nonprofits to benefit from the data analytics tool that Tableau Software provides. Chantilly Daganath, who you've met, is the founder of Lovelytics and Millennials in Data, whose mission is to bridge the data literacy and analytical skills gaps by training and mentoring and preparing millennials to enter a data-driven global environment. And Michael Smith, head of industry at Google, where he leads a team of strategic planning and business development professionals. Michael also has a long history of public service and nonprofit work and is a member of the Civic Influencers Board. So I have some questions for them, but I also want to invite everybody present to please go ahead and submit your questions in the chat. We'll either get to them now, get to them at the end, or if we fail to get to them in this hour, we'll respond by email after the, after the meeting is over. But I'm going to start with my first question for Neil of the Tableau Foundation. Neil, the Tableau Foundation has partnered with new, a number of nonprofits that create positive change in the world on issues including providing safe water for poor communities, education for low income students, alleviating poverty and homelessness. And now you're partnering with civic influencers, helping this organization to micro target solutions, which is my language, um, through data and data visualization. So why did Tableau Foundation make voting rights such a large commitment at this time? Thank you, Sharon, for the question. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, it's a great question. So just for a bit of context, Tableau Foundation has invested more than $78 million in data projects in 125 countries uh, since our founding in 2014. And we've seen how data can um, help organizations to do amazing things from stopping the spread of infectious diseases to ending homelessness and a bunch of other categories. And a, year, a little over a year ago, uh, Channing and I started a new initiative at Tableau Foundation called the Racial Justice Data Initiative. Uh, we did a lot of interviewing of people all around the world, all around the country, um, and decided that this $18 million initiative would focus on fighting anti-Black racism in America, focusing on four pillars, achieve, uh, achieving an equitable education, advancing criminal justice, and building both black, uh, political and economic power in Black and other communities of color. So uh, civic influencers fixed squarely under our political power building initiative. And we did indeed make a big bet. So for context, Tableau Foundation, normally when we make grants, they'll be under $100,000 initially, and then we'll sort of increase them over time as we build partnerships. Um, and uh, when focusing on this one, though, in particular, Channing and I decided we really needed to be bold. Um, we think the problem at hand around our democracy is an important one uh, that needs uh, help, and we really wanted to help our young people get involved. Uh, we evaluated several opportunities and really chose civic influencers. So our normal grants, up, like I said, are under $100,000. Typically, um, civic influencers was a new grant for us. So our first financial commitment to civic influencers was more than $500,000. It's the first time in our history we've made that big of a financial commitment out of the gate. 
Um, and we did so for a couple of reasons. One is that civic influencers has more than a decade of proven uh, success in the field, building youth civic engagement on college campuses and in communities. And that proven track record of uh, field-based work and success was really one of the, the main things that we anchored on. The second thing we anchored on is that Maxim's vision for using data uh, is, is really incredibly sharp um, and it's powerful. And we've seen success in some of our other data projects where there were similar visions. And we know that based on Maxim's vision that if we can really help them use data as effectively uh, as we have other partners, that this is gonna be a really powerful time for helping young people get engaged in uh, the voting system. So we're excited to be partnering here. I think what Chantilly's done on the dashboard is really amazing. And honestly, it's just the beginning of what I think we're gonna be able to do in this partnership. So back to you, Sharon. Thanks, Neil. And my next question is for you, Channing, also of the Tableau Foundation. Can you talk a little bit more about how this data-driven approach can augment and even transform the effort to improve our democracy by engaging more young people in the process and specifically young people who've been marginalized in the past? Yeah, thanks, Sharon, and thanks everybody for having me as well. Super excited to be a part of this panel and uh, here with the civic influencer community. Um, to answer that question, I'll start by saying uh, I'm super excited about this partnership. I know my entire uh, Tableau Foundation team is super excited about the way we're using data to combat some of these issues. And I'll just say to begin, you know, what we get excited about at the Tableau Foundation and at Tableau is obviously the facts, the analytics, the data that's at play. But I think with this partnership and partnerships that Neil mentioned as well, um, dating back to 2014, what we also get really um, excited and passionate about is the opportunity to make those facts, make that information and make that data more accessible, more actionable um, and more user friendly for the people in these communities and in these stakeholder groups essentially that will need to understand the information and then in turn communicate it to act on it. And so why that's so exciting for an organization like Civic Influencers is because they're really thinking about using data in an optimistic way and in an innovative way that really hasn't been done in the space of civic engagement and specifically combating uh, to using using data to combat voter suppression. And so, what the what this what this partnership and what this project essentially will be able to do is you'll be able to take this data or the the, the influencer influencers influencers in this case will be able to take the data and they will be able to illustrate and understand uh, better pretty much the injustices that have happened in the past, um, going back to the beginning of voter suppression, and then looking ahead and where we are now at how they can understand this information more efficiently to better inform the practical solutions that will be needed to ultimately create what is a more, uh, more equitable democracy. And this will directly enable the folks that are putting the boots on the ground to understand precisely where help and support is most support is most needed, as you can see on the map that Chantilly and uh, Maxim demoed earlier. And so by, by pinpointing exactly where voter suppression in this case um, is running uh, most rampant and is at its worst, this is gonna help create civic accessibility and mobilize the young people, the young leaders like Ariana and the rest of the civic influencers to collaborate together to form those solutions that will create impact and actually bring together a more inclusive way that communities can be involved in this effort. And so when we're talking about all data projects, we're talking about using these dashboards, that is what we at the Tableau Foundation really kind of hinder as the democratization of this data or the democratization of this information. And really what these leaders will be able to do is layer in that real time up to date information that needs to be made more accessible, that needs to be made um, more democratized essentially, so that these communities that have had barriers in place up to this point have entry points, have ways to collaborate and have ultimately ways to get inspired and see how data can be used to just further their efforts and um, help them become more informed so they can share out um, with folks on these campuses and folks in these surrounding communities. Um, so yeah, super excited about this and thanks Sharon for the question, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my next question is for Chantilly of uh, Loveletics and Millennials in Data, but before I even ask the question, I have to say, were we not on Zoom, we would have heard an audible wow when we saw your screen earlier. It's just stunning. 
Um, and so my question for you, Chantilly, is your work is all about helping people make sense of the world and take action through visualizing data. So why did you invest in civic influencers? What are you hoping to achieve, to achieve specifically with this partnership? Thank you so much uh, for the question. And thank you all so much for, for having me today. It's, it's definitely been a pleasure working with you all. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago that I myself was a student uh, on campus looking to, to register to vote and have a voice in the, the upcoming elections and understanding things like where to vote, when I can vote and the impact that I could truly have. Like, all that information wasn't really accessible at the time. Therefore, I think it's really great uh, that we're now using data to show youth the impact that they can have in the long term. And like Maxim mentioned earlier, it's important to show you know, the youth and other, uh, and other individuals exactly uh, how these campuses are performing and what's going on in these campuses. And I'd like to say, like, I'm truly happy to be a part of this movement and a part of this project and enable action through the use of data and data visualization. Thank you so much. Um, and now I have a question for Michael of Google. Um, Google, like the Tableau Foundation, doesn't make big investments lightly. Um, clearly, the work of civic influencers stood out for its potential to create real change. Why do you feel it's important for tech companies and civic-minded corporations to invest in voting and engaging more youth in the process? Well, thank you so much for the question, uh, Shannon. And, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Really excited to be a part of this fantastic project with such amazing partners. So to answer your question, um, I really think that uh, large tech organizations have an investment in uh, the civic discourse. Um, organizations like Google, like Facebook, and like Tableau um, are at its core engaging individual, let's call it retail users, um, in forming conversations, building connectivity with uh, community members. And uh, by working to build on the civic discourse, they're actually enabling these communities to uh, get better, to thrive. And I think that ultimately, when you think about uh, the missions at its core of these organizations, while sometimes stilted, um, that's really, really what they're trying to get at. They're trying to get at connectivity. They're trying to get at uh, the ability to change people's lives. You know, so I work, of course, with uh, you know in, within the apps ecosystem, and one of the things that we say is that uh, you know apps really is at the forefront of trying to improve people's lives, everyday lives. Even if you think about you know last mile delivery uh, services like DoorDash or Grubhub. They are um, really focusing on trying to just improve uh, and bring convenience to people's lives. And this is the same thing that civic influencers are doing um, in association with, of course, Tableau, Salesforce. Um, and uh, it's really fantastic just to see that, you know, we're trying to create uh, an ecosystem where uh, access to the vote, uh, access to civic discourse is made um, simpler, more convenient, um, more uh, form factors um, appropriate for the specific demographic that they're interested in. You know, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, this kind of concept of app first, um, you know, and that really is about meeting users where they are. Um, you know, for young people, you know, the apps ecosystem is really appropriate. If you think about the amount of time folks spend on apps like TikTok or Instagram, you know, they're really using apps as kind of an integral part of their daily existence. And so by, you know, meeting the users where they are, by using these uh, high functioning uh, data visualization tools that uh, eventually will find themselves in an app format, we're really, really kind of leading the, uh, the bleeding edge of this type of civic engagement. So. Uh, I think, you know, it's undeniable that these organizations really need to, to kind of focus again on building these types of conversations uh, to really lead to, to building more thriving communities. Thank you so much, Michael. So as somebody who's involved in engaging youth in the electoral process, I am also deeply invested in this work. That's why I created Columbia Votes at Columbia College Chicago. So this work of civic influencers resonates very deeply with me. 
But this is a press conference as well as a town hall. So why should journalists be interested in this story? Um, that's where the solutions journalism connection comes in and why Maxim asked me to moderate this. Because solutions journalism depends on data as well as people to tell stories. And not just stories to make people feel good, but stories that inspire and allow others to take similar action. People need to see evidence of solutions that are effective. And data is essential to that. And this is a story about what is effectively augmenting the youth vote. And I would argue that the future of journalism in many ways depends on social, uh, on solutions journalism and other innovative approaches to telling the whole story. Because we're in a bit of a crisis right now with people turning away from too much bad news. And solutions journalism and the reliable data that allows us to evaluate whether and how responses are working can re-engage audiences and journalists themselves. And in the same way, data can further engage youth in voting when they see how their votes can make a tangible difference. So this investment, this partnership is really exciting to have Goliaths of the data universe, Tableau and Google, investing in civic influencers data driven results oriented approach to bolstering the youth vote has the potential to bring about positive social change and inspire effective approaches that will extend far beyond this project's initial goals. One more thing I want to say that's worth stating at this point, although in recent times, some people have sought to portray voting as a partisan act and promoting the vote as a partisan act, we have to insist that it is not. Voting is a fundamental part of democracy. Engaging more citizens in voting is not a partisan act, it's a patriotic act. And so with that, I would like to ask Maxim Thorne to talk about how he expects these data to translate into programs and interventions that will positively affect voting behaviors of young people in 2022 and 2024 elections. Thanks, Sharon. I'm going to answer that question and try to answer two questions in the chat room in the same answer. That was for Bill and Roberta. When we see the data, some of it is surprising. Some surprises us, some surprises you. Um, we're able to then take that data and come up with very specific customized, what we're calling civic influencers action plans. So if, if we know uh, from folks like Ariana that a president is giving a holiday uh, on voting day or is not, uh, or we learn that for, for, the, for the folks on that particular area, having um, voter information that's in a different language or multiple languages is important. Or cell phone texting is the trigger to get young people out in that particular area or a polling site on campus or a shuttle bus or giving them money to actually have their signatures notarized, which is some of the strange new developments in the laws that have been passed. You heard, we have over 425 voter suppression bills that have been moving across the country in 49 states. 33 of those bills have passed and been signed into law in 19 states. Some of them specifically target young people, particularly young people of color. Some of them, like in Texas, actually include criminal penalties, one year in prison, up to 20 years in prison for things that re like relate to um, voter registration drives by third parties. We're a third party. We help young people do voter registration drives. Would we be uh, uh, criminally prosecuted? That's the chilling fear. Or, you know, in my previous, I, I'm a lawyer. I was involved in, in a lawsuit in Florida when Florida attempted to ban polling sites from college campuses. We did a study and what we found is that young people and in particular young people of color overwhelmingly voted uh, more than in any other kind of polling site when the polling site was on a college campus. So that seems like something we'd wanna make sure that we advocate for and our young people are advocating for polling sites um, on, their on their college campuses. So when we are crafting with, a, with our civic influencers like Ariana, a customized uh, uh, civic influencers action plan, it's almost like gene therapy, um, Sharon, which is, Specific, like your particular problems are quite different, say in 
Florida, Miami-Dade than they are in Michigan, where Eastern uh, Michigan University is, are quite different from what you might be experiencing in Virginia, right? Uh, Virginia 7, where Virginia Commonwealth University is. And so that data is also telling us um, about some surprising stuff about young people and young people's voting habits based on race. So we know that certain things are particularly affecting young people of color. Disappear, the, the disappearing polling sites um, in communities of color or where histor historically black colleges and universities are or where uh, First Nation campuses are or where Hispanic serving institutions are. And so that kind of stuff, once we, when we research voting habits, uh, we, 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 we have been able to see some rather surprising uh, things. I mentioned, for example, that debunks the stereotype about how people of color and youth of color vote. In uh, Florida 27, we've seen the majority, 95% of those campuses are students of color. But they, that uh, district has been flipping from Republican to, to Democrat number of times and youth of color have been performing quite differently. It also tells us how uh, we can help all young people uh, reconnect to the civic power grid. But there's one thing I want to show you that, 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 that I think you will find uh, extraordinarily interesting, Bill, since you've asked this question. Um, we are open to all kinds of data. What the data tells us about who is being affected, what the data tells us about how young people are voting. And this sort of data may surprise you. Right, it shows that um, young white uh, uh, people, 18 to 29, vote quite differently from young black people. And we also can then see the impact of various legislations or various kinds of te techniques that affect either white students differently or black students differently, or Latinx students differ diff differently, or the uh, entire Latinx diaspora differently. And then we think about how do we in fact help, how do we in fact help all of these students counter all of the various uh, things that are the, the liberty meant to either empower or shut them off uh, from their power. So that's why I think the data is so important, Sharon. Uh, it, is, it helps inform all of us what's happening and it helps uh, drill down into very specific things. Thanks, Maxim. I have one last question for um, the youngest of our panelists, who is Ari, who's here in person. Um, Ari, as a STEM major, who's done extensive and successful work in student voter engagement, what have you learned about the role of data in effective responses to the problems faced by students who are marginalized in the voting space? I definitely feel like data really helps to provide a very solid argument for any case we're trying to make about the inaccessible ways of voting on our campus. Because when you provide a data driven argument, you're providing something that's quantitative in nature. And it's a lot harder to argue against the numbers than say, more emotional arguments. And that's not to say that emotional arguments don't carry a lot of merit but when they're backed by numbers of this percentage of students that can't access this, or this number of students that can't do this, it becomes really difficult for anyone to give us any type of runaround of um, their proposed solutions that maybe might not work for as many students or might not be sustainable in the long term. Um, so we really just found that working together to create these quantitative answers has made these discussions with faculty and administration a lot more efficient and productive when trying to get to the end goal, which is to get everyone to the polls. Thanks so much. So now we're going to open it up to your questions. Please go ahead and continue to put those into the Q&A part on Zoom. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. And I want to start with a question from Keisha. Um, for Maxim, um, Kichi says, I'm interested to understand more about how civic influencers reach youth not tied to post-secondary institutions. How does your work, quote unquote, uncouple the civic engagement field's understanding of 18 to 24 year old voters to only be students? Uh, thank you, Keisha. That is the question uh, for folks who care about young people and care about uh, voting and our democracy. I said earlier, Keisha, and you know this, 20% decline nationwide in community college enrollment. Georgia, 50%. 
And it seems Miami-Dade, 50% decline uh, in community college enrollment. So you cannot just think about organizing young people uh, on college campus as the center of the universe. And that's how people have traditionally thought of it. When you think about organizing young people, you go on a college campus. The math will fail for those who are trying to empower and help young people if you don't get them where they congregate, where young people play, pray, eat, and work. So we are partnering with workforce development. We are partnering with trades. We are partnering, uh, we are actually using though, Keisha, um, the service learning components that you find in a number of campuses uh, in which, which young students are actually going into the community to tutor, work with Head Start, to mentor, to be part of like recreational activities and using those as entry points to get in and help young people. We also are so thrilled, by, I, I mentioned earlier. So Patrick Coakley, who has been a disability activist um, and the other with disability uh, policy, who is our chief of organizing advocacy and uh, learning, is also figuring out uh, we are all of those other young people who are disability advocates, Black Lives Matter activists, um, climate change activists, uh, uh, reproductive justice activists. And how do you how do you take advantage of those moments um, to help them connect the issues that they care about with voting? And so we're doing a whole set of novel work. Let me be very clear. Our civic influencers are not just campus based. It is the most amazing thing. It is a struggle. It's a heavy lift. Uh, one particular funder, Keisha, said to me, um, but how do we know it's going to work? Because no one has done this. How do we know it's going to work? Because it could fail. And I'm, and I'm sort of hesitant about funding something that might fail. My response, well, it will certainly fail if no one is doing it. Do you prefer that no one is doing it, so we're absolutely going to fail? Um, or do you prefer to take a chance? Uh, we have substantial data. We have enough of our allies and activists in this space. And I think it is essential to get to the numbers. You only have two choices. You only have two choices. We're either going to uh, do something that has never been done, even though we've been incrementally increasing the voting rate of college students. So you'd have to increase it by at least 20% or 50% in Georgia or 50% in Miami. Is that really realistic? Or you're going to have to be able to get to that 20% who are not on college campuses. And we believe we have a strategy. These heat maps these scorecards can help bring new allies, fabulous allies like Tableau to the conversation, new tools like dashboards, new way to digitally organize. And that's, well, that's our hope. That's our hope and that, that will keep uh, this democracy alive going in to 2022 and through 2024. Thanks, Keisha. Thanks, Sharon. Perfect segue into the next question, which I believe is for Neil. Um, from people from the media on the call. Will journalists have access to the dashboard as well? Absolutely. One of the things we are most excited about this concept is that uh, this wasn't a tool that was just being built for internal use at Civic Influencers. It's a tool that actually is going to be built and published publicly so that not only uh, will civic influencers be able to benefit from the data and the visualization and the understanding that comes out of it? But any other organization uh, around the country, uh, regardless of uh, you know, their, their priorities, could actually use the dashboard um, to engage young people in their community. And we're super excited about that potential uh, opportunity to really build youth, the youth vote um, and make sure their voices are heard in our government. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question before we go to closing remarks. It's the hour has flown. And this one's for Channing. Um, that how do you see data changing the civic changing civic engagement, especially youth civic engagement um, in in as co-leader of the racial justice initiative? Like how do you see this changing civic engagement and specifically youth civic engagement? Yeah, totally. Um, I think that's a great question. And I think, honestly, Ariana said it best. I think this generation um, and this, this demographic of youth leaders that are at play here are energized, are ready, are wanting to be involved in these conversations and wanting to actually provide impact to these campuses, but also the surrounding communities where they come from and represent. And I think what data will do is match, like, like Ariana said, it'll match that emotion, it'll complement that emotion and provide even more leverage, even more backing to the advocacy efforts, to the ways that they develop solutions and to the ways they also just collaborate and communicate 
um, the problems and the extreme um, levels of the issues at play on their campuses or in their surrounding communities, like I said before. So the data is going to really complement the emotion and the willingness of the generation. And I, what I think the data visualizations will end up doing is make that understanding and make that enablement process more easy to understand and more accessible to a broader amount of young people, regardless of their expertise in whether it's traditional data literacy or data capability. So when you match the data with the data visualization tools, it really just provides a higher level of empowerment um, which hopefully will lead to a more equitable um, process of political representation, which ties back to our um, initiative here at Tableau. Thanks. We're going to hold the rest of the questions and answer them um, via email. I'm going to throw it back to Maxim to close this out. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, you, you've seen here today something that I think is very novel. We believe in it. We believe in testing. We are interrogating where we deploy our resources. We would love to do the entire map that you saw. We'd love to do where all of those lightning bolts are. We'd love to do uh, all of the things where young people congregate and they are being shut off from our civic power grid. We can't do it without you. Here is a promise that Civic Influencers is making to all of you here today. It has to be supported. It has to be supported by the data. Our young people being shut off from the civic power grid in that community? Are they best practices as we saw with Virginia Commonwealth University or we know with Northwestern University in Chicago under the leadership of uh, Professor Peshkin? Is that what we can share with all the other people to, to do it? And are our strategies tested? Are they working or is this just something we always done? We are making a commitment here with the data-driven work to figure out uh, what strategies are tested and are improving, are innovative, we are embracing, not rebuffing, how young people want to think about their lives. It is, you know, I, I'm from a different generation. I used to be young. Uh, I'm not so young. Um, but it's important to listen to their frame and think about what are they saying? And there's a beautiful rainbow and diversity to what we are hearing and what they're saying and how they speak and who they're embracing. And who are their trusted allies and representatives? We need to have this sort of reverse mentorship. And that's why they're creating a lot of the novel data set that Neil talked about. They're populating the heat map. They are ranking what's affecting them on their campuses or in their communities. That has never been done. And the Youth Democracy Index is driven by what, what our civic influencers and all of the people that they're recruiting, like Ariana, is saying is affecting them on their campuses around those communities. That means that that heat map is live and constantly changing, whether in Virginia, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Virginia, New Jersey, and so forth. Uh, that is, and, and if the data changes, we tell you. If the data changes in terms of what is gonna work and where it's gonna work, we share it. 